Ski of Bern and co-director of the Kinneret uh, Regional Project. And his research focus is on the Near Eastern archaeology, mainly the Southern Levant in the Bronze and in the Iron Age and the glyptic art of the ancient Near East. And together with Ido Koch and Sylvia Schröer, uh, Christoph Uhlinger, he holds an SNF grant for stamp seals in the, um, from the Southern Levant. And this fits perfectly uh, his presentation uh, entitled Egyptian Stamp Seal Amulets from the Bronze and Iron Age Transjordan Overview and Selected Highlights. Stefan Wünger, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you, Laura, for the kind invitation and the kind words. Uh, so I try to start my presentation. Can you see my screen? Okay, great. So I will not talk about monuments uh, uh, in this respect, or at least not about big monuments, but small monuments. And I would like to concentrate on Egyptian stamp seal amulets from Bronze and Iron Age Transjordan to give you a short glimpse at Egyptiaka in uh, the, uh, the area of modern day Jordan. As you know, do stamp seals represent a highly informative artifact class? Uh, which prov provides crucial information on the social, cultural, and religious history of the Southern Levant. Their systematic study in terms of origin, production, diffusion, and acquisition, function, use, and consumption, deposition, hoarding, loss, etc., yields scores of insight into the daily life of ancient Levantine societies, institutions, groups, and individuals. In the following, I can only present some of the evidence about the Egyptian or Egyptianizing stamp seal amulets found in Transjordan during the second and the first millennium BCE. And having worked mainly on material found on the other side of the Jordan, I might not be the very specialist to talk about these artifacts. However, I will do my best to represent and advocate for this strain of cryptic families, which is sometimes overlooked. In doing so, I will heavily rely on Jörg Eckler's seminal catalogue about the seals and ceilings unearthed in present day Jordan. This standard work that Eckler co authored with Ottmar Kehl presents all available data until roughly the year 2005 and is a benchmark for the study of the glyptic material found east of the Jordan River. It not only comprises actual stamp seal amulets, but also includes the by then known cylinder seal material from this region. Eckler and Kehl's volume will soon be fully integrated in digital format into the corpus of the stamp seals from the Sun Levant, conven conveniently abbreviated CSSL a very powerful online research tool that is currently developed as part and backbone of the Joint Swiss Israeli research pro project Stamp Seals from the Southern Levant. This international and highly interdisciplinary project focuses on ancient stamp seals as a key medium for the study of second to first millennia historical entanglements in the Southern Levant. The project is funded by the Swiss National Science Foundation for the years 2020 until the year 2023. It engages a side of a board of directors consisting of Christoph Fühling, Silvia Schröer, Ida Koch and myself, an international team of postdoc researchers, PhD students, an ICT expert, student assistants and draft persons, as well as other technical staff that are based at the universities of Bern, Tel Aviv and Zurich. However, unfortunate for this workshop is that the updating and completion of the Transjordanian material to be integrated into CSSL will only happen at the later stage of our project, where we will, of course, include the assemblages of sites and regions explored and excavated after the publication of Eklin Kiel, such as the material from the Fenan area or items from sites like Tel Abu Haras, Tel Zira, and those quite many archaeological academic expeditions that began their, their work after fieldwork in Syria was not possible anymore. However, we will not be able to meet our high-flying high goals 
that are a comprehensive online cut catalog of all stem seal amulets from the whole Southern Levant without the support of the scholarly community that currently works in the region. Therefore, we appeal to our colleagues in the field to share with us the ecliptic material, to point us to yet unpublished items or overlooked items from older and more recent excavations, and to assist us when connecting with museums and storage facilities. In exchange, we will gladly share with you our expertise in glyptics and assist you in the analysis and publication of your material. Or even better, why not become a contributor on your own and submit and publish your material on the CSS, CSSL platform, as the final version of CSSL will include a citation generator compatible with online bibliographic tools and follow, following standard referen reference protocols uh, so your intellectual property will be granted and your on online publication will be cited. The, our team is a very dedicated and international team involving people originating from Brazil, Canada, Germany, Great Britain, Israel, Italy, Switzerland and the US. And we are very confident that the wide range diversity of expertise agglomerated agglomerated within our team, ranging from ancient history, archaeology, from different schools, Egyptology, history of religions, uh, biblical studies and other scholarly disciplines will undoubtedly enrich the methodological and epistemological vistas on the field of cryptology, very much to the profit of the overall project. And by the way, soon we will post a job offer for an attractive postdoc position. Uh, on the topic of the distribution of stem seal motifs in the Southern Levant. Please check the usual channels. But now let's turn back to the actual topic of this paper, Egyptiaca from Transjordan. It is fundamental to note that currently the whole body of all stem seal amulets found east of the Jordan is only about 5% of the estimated total of the whole corpus from the Southern Levant which is more than 10,000 items from legal excavations. This is certainly due to the fact that there are much more large academic excavations, past and ongoing in Cisjordan, and, but this is pure guesswork, that there are much less governmental salvage and rescue excavations, excavations in modern Jordan than in present day Israel. Breaking down the numbers for Transjordan only, we are left with about 650 items from all periods and manufacturers, of which only part belongs to the group to be discussed today. Based on Eckler and Kale, I counted, counted the total number of two, 260 items that can safely be called Egyptian or Egyptianized. The distributing pattern of the seals and ceilings of all kinds is as expected, if one overlays it with the settlement patterns of the Bronze and Iron Ages. Most of the items were found on the eastern side of the Jordan River in the upper part of the Great Rift Valley and on the fertile plateau between the Wadi Asarka and Wadi al Mujib, with highest concentrations in and around Amma. The lion's share of the Egyptian uh, items or Egyptianizing items, scarabs and other types of amulets date to the Middle Bronze Age II, followed by the Late Bronze Age specimens, which constitute circa 25% of the whole assemblage. Much fewer items date to the Iron Age I, which is roughly the 21st and the early, early 22nd dynasty, and only a handful can be attributed to the Iron Age II. This, is, this somewhat corresponds to the trend observed by Gregory Mumford in his 4,000 pages long dissertation, where he analyzed all Egyptianizing artifact, artifacts from selected sites in Syria, Palestine. But note, he did not cover the MD as well. If we look at the position of the artifacts, we see a recurring pattern that applies also for most of the following people. As for the Middle Bronze Age items, we can observe that roughly 35% were also deposited during the period of their production. A somewhat higher share was only deposited at a later stage during the transition from the MB to the LB, after which MB items gradually, gradually faded out in the material culture of Transfer Jordan. 
I'm pretty sure that the same pattern also applies for other regions. New material from the Middle Bronze Age that was not published by Eklund and Kehl and that illustrates the Transjordian glyptics of the Middle Bronze Age uh, is quite scarce. However, in an MB layer at Telzira, a, fine, a very fine example with the name Aus Re, the throne name of the, of the famous Hyksos ruler Apopis, was found. It is a highly welcome addition to the Transjordanian repertoire of attested names of our uh, pharaonic rulers. Thus far, beside Apopis, who is also attested at Pella, we know of 12 Egyptian queens and kings attested in the glyptic repertoire, ra uh, ranging from Sesostis III and ending with uh, Mykerinos uh, on a bulla found at Palua. Also for the late Bronze Age, we can observe that during this period, glyptic material was only deposited in larger quantities after the, after the late Bronze Age, which suggests that the late Bronze Age seals and seal amulets also later arrived in the regions east of the Jordan, similar to what we saw in the Middle Bronze Age, yet in fewer quantities. It stands to reasons, and uh, this refers also to what Alexander said uh, this morning, it stands to reason if such items which were deposited in later contexts, which are nowadays normally called heirlooms, if they are not actually looted material robbed in faraway Egypt from tombs and cemeteries and only later brought uh, to Asia. An item which takes up a long Levantine uh, tradition dating back to the beginning of the Middle Bronze Age comes from Tel Kafrian, a site positioned at a strategic location that prominently overlooks the central rift valley. The site is approximately uh, uh, 30 uh, kilometers southwest of Amman. It has been explored by a Greek team since the early 2000s. The history of occupation at Tel Kafrian lasts, according to the excavator, from prehistoric time, times until the Hellenistic period, with the seemingly strong presence of the Iron Age. The context of the scarab is unclear, as is, it, as is its documentation. Only meager photographs have been published yet, lacking measurements, information about the material, not showing side views, etc. The base of the scarab is diligently carved in a very clean and clear manner. Readable are the signs stool for reed matting, which represents the sound value P, the sign for bread, X1 in Gardiner's list, standard for T, a ches vase to favor or praise, and below a partly broken off hotep sign, actually a loaf lying on a reed mat signifying to be pleased. The arrangement of the signs immediately, immediately recalls the hieroglyphic sequence of the godly name Ptah, the Memphite god of craftsmanship and the creator god of maker of all, all things, as he is sometimes called. However, his name is normally written with another hieroglyph uh, instead of the, the Ches Ves, uh, V28, according to Gardiner, the shape, which is, uh, has the shape of a wick of a twisted flag, of twisted flag, flag, that phonetically represents the sound value for the guttural he in the in Ptah's name. I do not have an explanation for the substitution of the wick of the twisted of twisted flag with the he's ways, and Ptah is hardly ever displayed in conjunction with this hieroglyph. Aside, for example for a uh, quite light, late item from, the uh, from Cemetery 200 at Tel Far South, which is dated by Ottmar Kiel to the 25th to 26th Egyptian dynasty, where it forms a part of a phonetic epithet meaning rich in favors. But maybe the Egyptologists in this round may have an explanation for this. Uh, the Hotep sign, uh, however, can already be seen in connection with Ptah's uh, name on a Middle Bronze Age, quite early Middle Bronze Age scarab, which was published by Daphna Bintor in 2004. The engraving style uh, might point to a possible date of the item, uh, but as the item is very poorly uh, the item from Tel Kafrain is very poorly documented. I hesitate to give it a date. But uh, Tatiana Beute, a postdoc in our uh, 
a Synergia project, advised me on this item and uh, suggests that uh, this, the engraving style could be compared to the diligent style of the uh, of uh, beautifully carved and heavily glazed items found in the foundation deposits of the temple of Hatshepsut at El Bahari. If she is correct, this would suggest the 18th uh, dynasty date for its production during the days of the the third, which is the middle part of the 15th century BC. Another fine representative of the, of the late Bronze Age that was found, found in a cache in a late Bronze Age laid at Telzira <coughs> is this scalp measuring 37 uh, millimeters in length, which is by far above the average length, length of irregular scalp, scalps. It features on its base Neb Maatre in a cartouche, which is the throne name of Amenhotep III, who reigned in the first part of the 14th century BC. To the left of the cartouche is the epithet Tit Re, image of the god Re, which is less common than the usual, usual Tit Emen, image of the god Amu. The item belongs to a special group of medium sized commemorative scarabs with Amenhotep's uh, third name, uh, or Amenhotep third's name, and an accompanying ep epithet. They are usually made of faience and Baruch Brandl. Uh, and according to Baruch Brandl, scarabs belong to this group were excavated in the palatial complexes of Amin Hotep III at Kurop, at the entrance of the Fayum and uh, Malkata in Upper Egypt. They are thus an undoubtedly Egypt, Egyptian pro, uh, product. Brandl, who discussed it, such scarabs with regard to a specimen found at Pechemesh, you see, you see it on the left, uh, in length, further notes that this group of medium-sized commemorative scalps is the most common in the Eastern Mediterranean. In Great Kana, which includes Transjordan and the Phoenician coast, 20 scalps were found at 12 sites, five of which uh, these sites are acted as harbors. A very neat uh, parallel to the item from uh, Tel Sira uh, comes from, from not far away uh, across the Rift Valley from Bechean, uh, you can see it in the bottom right. Turning to the Iron Age one, it is only during this period that Egyptian and Egyptianizing items produced during the 21st and early 22nd dynasty were immediately absorbed, which means immediately deposited, and on, only a few entered the material cultures at the, at the culture, culture at the later stage. This means that during the Iron Age 1, glyptic material potentially arrived directly, directly from Egypt was quasi in, instantly consumed. As an example, I would like to present two quite interesting items that come from room 12 in early Iron Age co compound at Tel Abu Haraz. They are dated by the excavators, uh, the, 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 the level nine where they come from or phase nine where they come from is dated by the excavators to the 12th and 11th century bc based on radiocarbon dates provided the settlement phase was most likely active during the first part of the 11th century bc the item above is possibly not of egyptian origin at least it is hard to imagine although it is according to the information provided by the excavator made of instatite a material foreign to the southern levant but available in egypt and also cyprus a quite similar item comes from an unknown context in tel el far south and is dated by kill to the 19th and 20th dynasty while concentric circles are, are commonly found on middle bronze age items both in Canaan, but also in Egypt, they also occur, occur on scarabs and oval pieces with chief shape, shaped handles of the late bronze and early iron age, such as uh, uh, at Bejan and in other places. The, the item below comes from an early, it's the same early iron context as the one above and displays in in the view of the excavator, a very debased rendering of Menchet Re, the throne name of the famed Moses III. The item is yellow in color and made of composite material. Posthumous 
two most three scarabs come in all sorts of unusual renderings of the graphics of the throne name of, it, of this ruler of the 18th, 18th dynasty. However, I'm not able to see any resemblance of the lowest sign with the, in any case, compulsory hieroglyph the hieroglyphic rendering of the Dan Peak. Rather, I would like to suggest that the lower two signs are a very deep, uh, a very deep based rendering of 18, 18th dynasty motifs depicting the head of the falcon headed war, Montu, uh, god, uh, war god Montu with his typically double plume crown with the protruding ureus and a sun disk, a motif that occurs on several items from the Sad Levant, Egypt, and also on single items from all over the Mediterranean. This motif was only common after the long reign of Tutmosis the third, according to Jäger, who studied them in death. Thus, on the item of, from Tel Abu Haraz, uh, <clears throat> only the, the, the head of the falcon and the sun disk remain. And we have uh, also a, a similarly very debased uh, uh, rendering of this uh, iconim on an item from Megiddo, which is unpublished but currently hosted in the Archaeological Museum at Istanbul, uh, together with material excavated by Schumacher in the beginning of the 20th century. We cannot pass by the Iron Age one without mentioning the notorious early Iron Age mass produced series that is uniquely present in the Jordan Rift Valley, or in the Jordan Rift, Rift Valley part of Transjordan. While I do not wish to enter a debate about the homogeneity, the homogeneity of this series, it's a plural, I agree that they consist of several groups and certainly do not want to discuss their absolute date. They need to be mentioned as, as a potential in, uh, Egyptian import that started not before the famous Megiddo 6A horizon. Yet, I have to admit that my assumptions made almost 20 years ago may be slightly revised. revised. In a recent study, Veit Welske and uh, et al. have shown that a bronze Ushepti from the royal necropolis at Tanis associated with Susanis was made of Wadi Araba copper. Uh, Bent already mentioned this study uh, earlier. The connection with the Fenan mines, which is also attested in Phoenicia and Greece, has thus renewed already during the 21st dynasty and not as a previously assumed under Sheshon I, the Libyan founder of the 22nd dynasty. Nevertheless, Sheshonk is prominently present in the Feinan area with this fine clip, with this fine clip the piece that clearly bears his throne name, Hedgehep Re Setep Im Be, uh, rather uh, seldom with Bahrain. Bright is the manifestation of Re chosen uh, of Amun Re. Alas, it is a surface find, but it is still only the second epigraphic attestation of the famous. Pharaoh Sheshonk ever discovered in Cis and Transjordan. Moving on to the Iron Age II, where the amount of Egyptian and or Egyptianizing items becomes very meager. But note again the deposition pattern. Only few are deposited immediately and some are only deposited at a later stage. In lack of a suitable new, new item that's, that has not yet been published by Eklund Kale, I would like to present a locally made stamp seal, or possibly it's only a potchart, of which we, can, we only know that it comes from an Iron Age context at Tel El Fuhar in Northern Jordan. According to the excavators, it was prob probably made from a small loop handle of a vessel. The incised decoration was made after being fired, after, the, after, after firing. It shows a standing anthropoid figure with one arm raised that is holding what some could say has a similarity with the uh, sign Anr. I present this item as a local product from the Transjordanian hinterland imitating Egyptian symbolism. If I would uh, make an analogy with uh, Shirley's uh, talk from yesterday when she mentioned how fashionable it was to speak French, uh, uh, in, in, in Europe uh, centuries ago, uh, I would need to, to say that what we see here is Egyptian, but with an ugly and very heavy accent in a way. So the iconography of the, of the, the Fukhar seal might have 
these prototypes in gra graphic renderings of, of a standing figure holding an anch. This motif can be encountered throughout the later Bronze Ages. You see the examples in the, in the upper row. And also a similar gesture can be seen on a locally made cylinder seal found in the debris of the Elbe Temple in the Armea, Amman airport area. Also, I could discuss here now the, the question of, of found links. Uh, so material which is found in a utterly later phase. Uh, an example would be uh, this uh, uh, Ramesside scarab from a uh, 6th century CE tomb from Hippet de Sanna. Uh, it has been published by Alexander Ahrens. And it is very interesting to, to see that first uh, in Trans Jordan, we have quite many of these very, very late occurrences, especially in Byzantine tombs. And it is also interesting to note that this amulet seemingly was uh, a part of, of, the, of, the, of the personal ornaments of the deceased. So this item was still worn uh, in 6th century CE. Uh, Transjordan. Summing up, the deposition of Egyptianizing or Egyptian glyptics throughout the centuries followed a certain pattern according to which only 25 to 23 percent were immediately deposited, allowing us to determine the intensi intensity of the immediate and contemporary Egyptian cultural impact. If we were taken to account material that was disposed later, our, we, our view on the respective contemporary assemblages might be blurred. Yet, it is only during the Iron Age one when most of the Egyptian glyptic goods were absorbed immediately, thus suggesting that Egypt was quite close at that, at that time. Uh, I offer this uh, map to show uh, how the, uh, the, the distribution happened and where. So during the late Bronze, the Middle Bronze Age and the Late Bronze Age and the Iron Age II, we have primary depositions mainly or almost uniquely in the upper part of the Jordan Rift Valley and in, uh, in, 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 the, in the Northern Plateau. On the other hand, during the Iron Age I, uh, we have uh, also uh, quite a few uh, uh, Egyptian imports in the southern part of the, of the Rift Valley in the Feynman area suggested, suggesting that these items uh, uh, arrived directly from the south, while on the other hand, uh, during the other periods, especially during the Middle Bronze Age II and uh, during the Iron Age II, uh, the Egyptian items possibly uh, arrived uh, in Transjordan uh, via the hub, via Phoenician hub, be it located uh, during the Middle Bronze Age, let's say at Biblos, or later during the Iron Age II, uh, it's been uh, located in, uh, at harbors like Tel Dor. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan Münger, for this uh, interesting presentation. And now, again, we have uh, time for questions and comments. Um, please just raise your hand or unmute your microphone to Alexandra von Lieben. Uh, thank you very much um, for this scarab you showed um, with the funny vessel instead of the uh, H with a dot. Uh, I think the explanation is probably a simple similarity of shape. Yeah. Um, the one which you showed immediately after um, was even looking quite like that. So um, one can see how an artist would have got the idea, um, which of course would speak in favor of somebody who has produced this was not actually able to read it. This must not necessarily mean that it is um, a local product, but it could speak in that uh, direction. So Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's a good explanation. Thanks a lot.
I think Erin. Erin. We cannot Aaron, hear. Yeah. Oh, now, now we're here. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. Um, two things. One, just a uh, a rather surprised comment on the on the extremely small amount of uh, good dick from uh, from Jordan. Uh, it's you really get the feeling that um, in in Yiddish we say uh, Trans Jordan was a Yehupitz, uh, the end of nowhere. Uh, the uh, no, nothing was getting out. The, the, but my main question is regarding. Regarding the um, the Iron One, uh, first of all, the sample is very small. But when you say Iron One, uh, I have a feeling you mean really late Iron One, early Iron Two A, is not. And and if that's the case, then I think um, you can perhaps explain um, the location of the Glyphics both in the south and the north, uh, connected to the, the the copper trade patterns. Yes. Um, yes. Because yes. Both, both going from uh, Fenan towards Egypt directly um, through mm -hmm. the Negev Highlands, mm -hmm. but also the track going northwards um, uh, through the Jordan Valley to Rehov, to Phoenicia, uh, and then you, and then you and a very nice explanation of it. That is if 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 the that, that glyptic dates to that uh, the phase of the let's say the 10th and 9th century when we have that activity. Yeah, I would I would date it so you are right. My my Iron Age one was quite is quite in this respect quite a late uh, Iron Age one. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, prior to to uh, secret imports like black and red, so, of course. Um, uh, true. It's the it is very interesting that that and one should note that if we speak about Trans Jordan and if we speak about the Jordan Rift Valley, we speak actually about two different things. So the, the, the Jordan Rift Valley should be viewed as not cis and trans, but as a, as a geographical entity on its own. Uh, um, and the plateau is a different thing. And it, it's, it's really amazing how, how few items uh, reached also in the Iron Age two reached the south of, 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 uh, of Transjordan. So we have very, very little material. And the, po uh, po uh, the, the, the few items from Transjordan in general, of course, is explained by less expeditions, less governmental uh, archaeology. Uh, but the, the, I think, the, but uh, I don't have statistics on this. Uh, it seems to me that in Transjordan we have quite, during the Iron Age, we have quite many local products uh, mixing different uh, uh, influences. This would, all, would be another topic to, to analyze the, the locally made stuff vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the influences, the outside influences. Uh, but indeed we have, we have very, very few uh, uh, data. On, on, in, this, in this regard. Also, the, the, the monumental stuff is, is there, of course, the Palua Stela, who, no, who nobody really understands, uh, sheds light on, 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 uh, on some Egyptian Transjordanian interaction, but uh, who knows? Okay, we have another uh, question by Joachim Quack. Yeah, first of all, thank you also on my part for a very interesting lecture and I would risk a few proposals for uh, the inscriptions first, the one already um, discussed by Alexander von Lieven. I would say one possible explanation is that the craftsmen, the craftsman who produced it indeed knew how to make hieroglyphs without necessarily knowing exactly what they meant because so to say somebody who works in fayas is a specialist craftsman and he might have learned the basic shape without really um, having learned the meaning so in my eyes it's more likely that it was an egyptian craftsman because the hieroglyphs as forms are very exact and careful mm -hmm. only he got a wrong one because it looked a bit similar mm -hmm. And then the other one, this uh, possible debased Menchepare scarab you discussed. Uh, and I looked at it a bit, and to me, it looked like the, maybe there was just on top Men and Re, and mm -hmm. then below we had Tit and Re, Re image of Re. That's, that's uh, very nice. Yeah, yeah, it's, 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 yes, yes. 
I will look, look into this. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. OK. Thank you very much uh, once again, Stefan Münger, for this uh, presentation and uh, all those uh, asking questions. We are coming now to our, to our last uh, talk.